as I've reflected about that, that evening, um, it's, it's reminded me of the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 14, where Jesus is invited to the home of a prominent Pharisee. And when he gets there, he observes that the guests are vying for the seats of honor at the, at the main table. You know, it's like, man, everyone's want to, wanting the place of honor. And Jesus tells them this parable. He says, um, if you're invited to a place, um, don't be too quick to rush to the seat of honor. Because it might be that there's someone more important who's been invited. And then your host would have to come to you and say, hey, could you please give up your place for this person? And you would be humiliated when you have to get up and <laughs> go and find, by then it will probably be the seat of least honor because the room's full. And you're like, oh my gosh, where am I going to sit? Where am I going to sit? It's pretty awkward. He says, rather, um, when you get to that place, you know, just take, a, take an ordinary seat. And it might be that your host would come to you and say, hey, Arthur, come up to a, come up to a better seat. Come up to a seat of honor. Um, honor is it's an important thing isn't it in, in, in society it's important in the way we, we conduct ourselves in relationships um, it's important in a, in a community uh, honor does, does matter and over the last month or so as a leadership team we've been thinking God what's, what's kind of the next thing for us as a church what, what do you want us to zone in on. You know, what do you want us to focus in on? And we just felt that God was saying, I want you to talk about honor. I want you to speak about this issue of, of honor. Um, if we have a culture of honor, and by the way, there are no seats of honor in this church. You, know, you, can, you, can, sit, you can sit anywhere. Uh, you're very welcome to sit in any of these, in any of these seats. Um, but if, if, we, you know, if we have a culture of honor, uh, that's likely to, to be something that builds and brings life. And even as we think into the future together, we can probably see a, a future together. But if we, if we don't have honor, the relationships are probably going to be kind of awkward. And, um, and even as we think into the future, we'll be thinking, man, that is, just isn't the honor in this situation. What does the future look like for us? So we'll be spending uh, today and the next seven Sundays actually looking at the topic of honor. And where we're going to start today is we're going to start with honor between God the Father and God the Son. It's a good place to start because before we start talking about honor among ourselves, it makes sense to see what we can learn from God, right? And we know that God is uh, God the Father, uh, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. There is one God, and this one God is three persons: Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And each of these three persons is fully God. For the purposes of this morning, we are not going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. We'll be zoning in uh, on the Father and the Son. If you have a Bible with you, and I hope you do. I encourage us to come here with our Bibles so you can open it up and follow and then you can go home and read it for yourself. Please do come with one. Uh, in case you haven't, we will have the verses up on the screen. We're also mindful that in a community like ours, there will be people at different stages of their journey of faith. So some of us here might actually still be trying to figure out Jesus and who Jesus is and what does it mean to really follow Jesus. So if you're here, uh, you know, without a Bible, that, you know, that we're not surprised. And, and we hope that the verses up on the screen can be of some help to you. I have two points. And those two points are the Son honors the Father and the Father honors the Son. Let's read from John chapter 6, verses 28 to 38. Then they asked him, What must we do to do the works God requires? 
Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, what sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. We'll start with the son honors the father. With the help of his disciples, Jesus had miraculously fed a large crowd with five small barley loaves and two fish. He then goes on to walk on water. I mean, these are the kind of things that Jesus does, right? He multiplies bread and fish and he feeds the hungry and then he walks on water. He is a miracle working God, even as we have sung this morning. And then his disciples connect with him as he reaches the shore on the other side. He had walked across the Sea of Galilee. And when they meet with Jesus, they're actually afraid. I mean, who would not be afraid if you see someone walking on water? Probably think it's a ghost. But Jesus says to them, it is I, do not be afraid. And they calm down and they let him into the boat. Meanwhile, the crowd that he had fed is looking for him. And when they eventually find him, they had some questions to ask him, including the questions that we have just read in our passage. What must we do to do the works God requires? And Jesus answered, the work of God is to believe the one he has sent now that statement needs us to pause for a moment at the beginning as Christine was encouraging us to come into a time of worship she made reference to the fact that we are no longer under the law rules and regulations and she made specific reference to circumcision from uh, the book of Galatians and perhaps these guys as they were asking Jesus what are the works what are the things that God requires they were expecting some list this is what you must do these are the things that I expect you to take off and Jesus says to them the work of God is to believe to believe in the one that God has sent. Jesus, what about the the list of do this and don't do that? Yes, there's things that we do and do not do as Christians, but Christianity begins with believing in the one that has been sent, believing in Jesus Christ. That is the most significant work. The work that is required is that you would believe. In the one that God has sent. Believe that this one that has been sent is the way to the Father. Believe that through Him we can have eternal life. 
Believe that through his death on the cross, our sins are paid for and we are forgiven. Believe that he rose to life from the dead. And because of that, we have new life. And death is not the end for us. Believe in the one that has been sent, Jesus Christ. Have we believed in Jesus? Jesus underlines something else here. The fact that he has been sent. Believe in the one that has been sent. He is under the authority of God the Father. The Father is fully God. The Son is fully God. However, the Son is under the authority of the Father. That is why the Father can send the Son. There is nowhere where the Son God the Son, Jesus sends the Father. It is the Father who sends the Son. Why? Because the way the honor dynamic plays out between God the Father and God the Son is that although they are both fully God, it is the Father who has greater authority than the Son. And that is why He sends the Son. He has been sent. As they hear these things, the crowd is, is doing the math in their head. So it's about believing in the one that's been sent. It's about believing in you. So Jesus, you're telling us that it's about you. It's not surprising what their next questions are. What sign will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Interesting questions given that Jesus had just fed them in their thousands in a miraculous way. And and they're asking for, what's the next sign? The the, the chasing after signs, this thing of signs, it can be a a challenging road, can't it? Well, we've seen a sign. What's the next sign? And the next sign, show us some signs. And, and Jesus is he's happy to show signs. He's happy to do miracles. But if, if it's all about what's the next sign, it's like, hey, hang on. Believe. Believe in me. And, and how does Jesus react? How does Jesus react to this? It's all about you, Jesus. Does he, does he lap it up? Is Jesus like, of course, it is all about me. Don't you remember, I just fed you in your thousands. I took five small loaves and I multiplied them. And we even collected excess at the end. And in case you missed it, by the way, after that, I walked on water. It is all about me, actually. So let me just give some thought to the next thing that I'm going to do. Is that what Jesus does? Does he kind of just, yeah, feed me and I want to do the next thing? That's not what Jesus does. Jesus points them to the Father. He honors the Father. It's true that Jesus is a big part of the story. And he's not shy to make that clear. He says, I am the bread of life but not before pointing them to the Father, not before honoring the Father. We've heard about Moses this morning uh, in the the singing and I think in the passage that was read as well. Moses led the Israelites out of captivity in Egypt, brought them into freedom. And, And Moses was a was an instrument, a mighty instrument in the hands of God for the deliverance of the Israelites. And Jesus makes reference to to Moses as well. When the Israelites got to the Red Sea with the armies of Pharaoh pursuing, God used Moses. He said some specific things to Moses. He said, Moses, you you should raise your staff 
stretch out your hand over the waters so that the people can walk on, on dry ground. There was an instruction from God. God was, was working through Moses. He had said some things to Moses and Moses responds and, and God works through Moses in a powerful way. That's in Exodus 14. By the time we get to Exodus 16, the Israelites are in this place called the desert of sin. Now, if, if you're like me, you're thinking, man, sit, desert of sin, something bad's probably going to happen. And it does. They start grumbling. They start complaining. Moses and Aaron, you, you guys, you, you've brought us out into this wilderness, into this desert so that we would die. That, that's why it would have been better if we stayed back there. And, and they start giving some kind of a romantic picture of Egypt, which wasn't true. And what, what happens? Well, God could have, he could have told Moses, Moses, you do something. I'm going to use you. I want you to position yourself like this and do this. But that's not what happens. God says that I myself will rain down bread from heaven. God intervenes directly and he feeds the people himself. And he sends them manna, bread, and he sends them quail, meat. God himself feeds his people directly because actually the grumbling against Moses and Aaron was grumbling against him. As Jesus addressed the crowd, he said, But it is not Moses, but my Father, who gives you the true bread from heaven. He, he's referring to these events from long ago, but he's also referring to what was happening there. The fact that it was the Father in heaven who had given them the true bread, which is Jesus Christ. It was God himself who had given. So if, if, if there's an aspect in which, well, we want to honor you, Jesus. We want to, hey, what are you going to do? Jesus is like, hang on, guys. Actually, it's the Father. Whatever's happening here, it's the Father. Whatever's going on here, I'm looking to the Father. It's the Father who's given. It's the Father who's doing this. I'm honoring him. Jesus points to the Father. It's my Father who gives you. He honors the Father by taking the attention of himself and giving the Father the focus. He honors the Father by giving the credit where the credit is due. We could say that Jesus was having some sort of success in ministry. And that's a dangerous concept, isn't it? Success in ministry. Especially when it's measured by numbers. Oh, 5,000 men and... and you know, women and children, wow, 15,000 people there around about. Whoa, that's amazing. Well, read the story a bit later on. They, they're deserting Jesus. But there's, there's an element in which he's, there's a sense in which he's, he's having an impact. Things are happening. And, 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 and for, for us as, as people, one of the temptations we have when things are happening is to, to take the glory. To take the credit and say, hey, wow, look at how things are going. Things are going so well. But Jesus does not do that. One of the highlights of, of our school calendar is, is an evening where our senior students have a graduation dinner. And at this graduation dinner, everyone's dressed up and, you know, kids come with their parents and um, one of the moments I really enjoy is, is when the kids are then given an opportunity, uh, given a microphone and, hey, here's a chance for you to say whatever you want to say to, to the people in the room. And usually what happens as these kids speak, they get to a place where they start to speak about their parents. 
talk about how mom and dad have made sacrifices, how mom and dad have kind of made it possible to, to get through school and so on. We might not see a lot of mom and dad, but behind the scenes, there's credit that's going to mom and dad. There's an honoring of the father. There's an honoring of mom and saying, hey, you know what? We, we just need to honor those who are helping us to make this possible. And Jesus was ready to, he's going to give honor to the father. Jesus had a following. Doesn't really take credit for the following. He says, all those the Father gives me. Who has given Jesus the following? It's the Father. All those the Father gives me will come to me. I find that pretty remarkable because when Jesus was calling his disciples, he was very intentional. He is the one who went out and looked for them and said, Hey, Don, you come follow me. Hey, Anna, you come follow me. Hey, I want you to follow me. You and you. And he's very intentional as he calls people to himself. But Jesus is saying, actually, the following I have is because of the Father. All those the Father has given me will come to me. And he's secure in the Father. He's like, well, if the Father's given them to me, they will come. They will follow even those who I haven't yet called, those I haven't yet interacted with, they will come because I'm secure in the authority, in the sovereignty, in being submitted to the leadership of the Father. They will come to me. Doesn't mean Jesus doesn't take initiative. He takes initiative. He's out there. He's front-footed, but he's, he's submitted to the Father. As I, as I thought about this, I was thinking, if, if I have anyone following me as, a, as an elder here at this church, if any of us has anyone following us in any area of influence, whatever your um, area of influence might be, how much credit are we actually taking? Are we, are we perhaps sometimes taking too much credit? Because for Jesus, he, he was saying, actually, I, I want to give the Father the credit here. And I just want to encourage us to just follow that example and say, hey, you know what? The Father, he's the one who gives. He's the one who makes anything possible. He's the one who creates the environment, who gives the grace for anything that allows us to have influence in our lives. For I have come down from heaven. Jesus says, I have, I have come down from heaven. Heaven is a place of honor. We get glimpses of heaven as we read through the Bible, but clearly it is a place of honor. The, the seat of honor that Jesus has in heaven, it's, it's amazing. But Jesus was willing to be sent away from that seat of honor, and he has come down from heaven. He has come to this earth he's come to be in a world that he created he has come to live among those that he created and not only to live among those he has created he has come and has become like one of them he is still fully god that never changed but he has also become fully man the incarnation god who takes on flesh he did that in order to honor the Father. He left the splendor and majesty, the glory of heaven to come down and be with us. Honoring the Father. And he goes on to say, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. Jesus honored the Father by submitting to his will. The mission that Jesus came to accomplish on this earth was initiated by the Father. Jesus did not come here to do his own thing. 
It's not like, you know, I, I have an idea, Dad. You know what I think? I'm going to go down to earth and do some stuff. No, actually, it was, it was the father who initiated. It was the father who said, this is how it's going to go. And it was the son who submitted to the father's will and said, what I have come to do is constrained. It is within the bounds of what the father has said. Within the bounds of the will of the father. That's what Jesus came to do. And this is, it's mind-blowing because Jesus is fully God. Yet he is so willing to honor the Father. And, and the question I've had in my mind is, if, if Jesus is, is that committed to honoring the Father... How committed should we be to honoring the Father? If Jesus, God the Son, honored God the Father, then our appropriate response, our only response really can be that we too should honor the Father. Amen. Let's turn to our second point. The Father honors the Son. The Father honors the Son. We've made reference to the disciples. The leader of the disciples was Peter. And not only was Peter the leader of the disciples, he was also part of Jesus' inner circle, together with James and John. And one of the most um, remarkable events that these three guys got to experience is recorded in Matthew 17. It's referred to as the transfiguration. So Jesus calls them and he says, hey guys, we're going to go up a high mountain. And they get there. And while they're there, uh, Jesus' face, it, it shone like the sun. And his, his clothes became as white as the light and these guys get to see this it's like wow this is amazing but it, it doesn't end there as this is happening uh, Moses comes Moses representing the law which Jesus fulfilled completely and Elijah comes representing the prophets and Jesus fulfilled prophecy concerning himself and they come and, and, and the three of them are, are talking and these guys are getting to see this happen and as it's happening uh, Peter who, who sometimes was a verbal processor as he sees he speaks he starts to speak and he's like uh, Lord you know it, it's good and, uh, and, 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 and maybe we, you know, we can build a shelter for, for you uh, one shelter for you uh, and, and another shelter for Moses and, and another shelter for, for Elijah and the Bible says while he was still speaking it's a bright cloud covers, comes over them and from that cloud there is a voice and the voice is the voice of God the Father. And the voice says, This is my Son, whom I love. In Him, with Him, I am well pleased. Listen to Him. Those are words of honor. The Father is honoring the Son. And those words had, a, they had an impact on Peter. They, they left a, a strong impression on him. Because when, when Peter begins to, to write letters to the, to the different churches that he was involved with, he, he actually makes reference to those words. So in his second letter, in the first chapter, he, he says this, from verses 16 to 18. For we did not follow cleverly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ in power. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He received honor 
and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. Peter is telling them, what we told you about is not made up stuff. We saw the majesty of Jesus. We were eyewitnesses. We actually beheld it with our eyes. And Peter affirms this father-son relationship between God the Father and God the Son. He tells his, his audience that the Father gave honor and gave glory to the Son. We heard the voice on the mountain. When God the Father in the presence of, of Peter and James and John and Moses and Elijah... When God the Father said those words, He was honoring the Son. He was giving honor to God the Son. In Philippians chapter 2, we're told that because of Jesus' humility to come down from heaven, as He was saying to the crowd in in the passage in John, because of that humility to come down and, and, and take on flesh, because of his humility to go and die on the cross for our sins, the Father has honored him. He's honored him by giving him, by exalting him to the highest place. Wow. Father exalts the Son to the highest place. How do we even comprehend that? And by giving him the name that is above every other name. The father honors the son. And this was for the glory of God the father. This honor is flowing in both directions. Father to son, son to father, Son to Father, Father to Son. Do we honor God the Son? If God the Father honors the Son, how, how should we respond to the Son? Do we honor Jesus by saying, he is the Son of God. Because that's what God did. He said, that's my Son. Do we honor Jesus by saying, hey, He is the Son of God? Do we honor Jesus by saying, I love Jesus. I love Him. Because that's what the Father did. He says, I love my Son. Do we honor Jesus by saying, listen to, listen to Him? That's what the Father did. The Father said, listen to Him. Do we tell ourselves, hey, Sheshi, listen to the Son. Are we honoring the Son? Sometimes we, we might think that because I have the greater authority, honor should flow in one direction. I am the, I'm the parent. Um, I'm the leader. Um... I'm the boss tomorrow morning at work. So we, we can get into a thinking that actually the honor traffic is single lane. It all comes my way. But actually what, what we see from the Bible is that the honor traffic flows in both directions. It flows from greater authority to less authority and from less authority to great authority. The father honors the son. The son honors the father. As a parent, yes, there is more weight on children honoring their parents. 
but do we not also honor our children, treat them in, in a way that's respectful and the fact that they're also created in the image of God. Yes, bosses, you have a, a mandate, a responsibility to be the one who can tell this one to go there, that one to go there. But does that mean that there isn't a respect for those people and honoring of them? It goes both ways. And that's what this relationship between the father and the son is showing us this morning. In my brief experience as a pastor in Dar es Salaam, I, I think there's a tendency to over-honor spiritual leaders. The tendency is a, a lot of honor to the, to the pastors, the leaders. That's, that, that's my observation. And, and there's nothing wrong with honoring leaders. But uh, it's not right if, if it only goes in one direction. It, it should be flowing in the other direction as well. So like, yeah, I, I want to honor. We want to be honoring each other. That's what God, the Father and God the Son, shows us today. I'm coming to a close. If we all gave ourselves fully to honoring God the Father and honoring God the Son, that could take us to a place of greater strength in having a culture of honor. I believe we already have a culture of honor. But in any good thing, we want to be growing, don't we? And, and if we say, hey, come on, let's, let's give ourselves even more fully to honoring the Father and honoring the Son, that would just help us create an even stronger culture of honor. And I think that's something for us to look forward to, something for us to trust God for, that we would have moments in our own personal lives where even this week to pause and think how can I show more honor to the Father this week? So I challenge you like as we leave here what, what are the areas of your life where you can God the Father I want to show more honor to you. Where, where are those places this week where you can show more honor to God the Son? Just come before Jesus, the one who has been given a name above every other name. And how, how can you in your life show more honor to him? We want to start with this relationship before we go into these relationships. Before we can talk about, hey, Arthur, you need to honor me and I need to honor you. Great. We've touched a little bit on that today. There's definitely application. But, but, but really, the, the essence of what we're hearing today is, wow, if the Father honored the Son, we should honor the Son. And if the Son honored the Father, we should honor the Father. And I hope that this week, all of us can grow in that. I'm going to pray. I do welcome the, the worship team to come up as well at this time. Just to help us with some, some background music. Father, thank you for each and every one of us here today. Thank you for the amazing love that you have for us. Lord, we know that we don't always give you the honor 
that you deserve. Please help us to grow in honoring you. Even as the Son, our Lord Jesus, honors you perfectly. We know we will never be perfect, but we do long to grow in this. Lord, we also ask that you would help us to to honor the Son, to honor Jesus. submit to his lordship to follow his lead totally Lord we pray that the culture of honor in this community in our church would wouldn't start with a man centered focus but it would start with a God centered focus we would get God right, God's place right, the place of the Father, the place of the Son right in our lives. Help us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name. I just want to ask this morning as well, if there's, um, if there's anyone here who you haven't yet actually believed in Jesus and surrendered to him remember that first question was what should we do to do the works of God and Jesus said believe in the one who has been sent if you haven't yet believed in Jesus if you haven't yet done that you know you can do that right now you can make a decision right now because God is stirring your heart. God is knocking on the door of your heart and he's saying, I, wanna, I want to be Lord. I want you to believe in me. And you can do that. You can say to him, Jesus, I, I choose to believe in you now. I choose to surrender to you now. I choose to give my life to you. I want to follow you. I want to honor you in that way. I choose to believe that you did die for me that on the cross you did pay for my sins that I am forgiven because of that and and I I want to follow you you can do that right now so why why don't you if that's you why don't you do that right now and I'm gonna say some words just as a help as you, as you speak with God. And if that's you, I, I invite you to repeat these words. Lord Jesus, I see today that I need you more than I need your miracles. I need to believe in you. Please forgive me of my sins. I do believe that you died for me. You took my place. And the punishment that was meant for me, you took because you were humble enough to leave heaven and die on the cross. I believe that you rose again. And because you rose again, I, I have new life and I can look forward to eternal life. Thank you for what you've done.